Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be going over the news, and I'm going to start with Pierce Morgan interviewing Jocko. My, uh, my critique will be in the middle as I'm playing this. Please make sure you subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube, Brighty on BitChute and Rumble. Make sure that you also subscribe to my X feed and my Gitter feed so you can get notifications. There is censorship that's going on on YouTube, especially for the ones that are like myself that have covered sensitive you know, topics. So make sure you subscribe to all six channels. That way you can see my work and also subscribe to X and my Gitter feed. Uh, all the links are in the description of this video and all my videos. So make sure you subscribe and follow. Let's begin. William Jr. is a former U.S. Navy SEALs commander who earned bronze and silver stars for serving his country in Iraq and other places. Many millions now know him as an author, an entrepreneur, and a doyen of discipline. Legion to listen to his podcast on leadership. Joe Rogan and Dr. Jordan Peterson are friends and fans. Brace yourselves because John Willink today is going uncensored. If you're arrogant and you think, oh, nothing will ever happen, we're, we're more than prepared to do this, well, then you might cut corners, then you might not train as hard, then you might not prepare as well. I was never in a situation where I was sitting there having my life flash before my eyes. I was always sitting there trying to figure out what our next move was going to be. How do you deal with that? Are you an emotional guy? You know, the thing is with Jocko, I'm sure a lot of people watch him and, you know, and may get some good advice on certain things. And there is some things that he does say that make some sense, especially taking ownership of, of you know, your actions and be responsible for your life. But the problem here is with the whole SEAL team, there's a lot of problems with the whole special forces with the military. One problem is, is that a lot of them are degenerates, social degenerates. And they go into the military because of their being socially degenerate. The second issue, even if they're not socially degenerate, uh, we spend way too much money on special forces and not enough uh, training and uh, recruitment and support for conventional garden variety warfare in the branches of service, the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, right? We're too focused on special forces, too surgical, and we haven't won a war. The fact is, you know, Mr. SEAL Team 6, Jacko, he didn't win a war. Fact. All right. So, you know, and then they get out, they get it, they get, re they retire and they have a nice pension. With all this training that they have, with all this understanding of how the government works, with this kind of, and they have a, a global understanding of international affairs because they're in the middle of it. All right. Why didn't they be, why weren't they more forceful? during the crisis in 2020 on what the government was doing to their American citizens. They, SEAL Team 6 and all SEAL Team 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 2, two infinitum, because of the American taxpayer pays for it, why didn't they step up the plate, set aside their pension, and actually do the right thing and inform the public of the nefarious things that the government's doing? especially when it comes to the national security state. Jacko didn't do that. Jacko's part of the fucking problem. What's your view of take? When was the last time you cried? What do you think of Jesus? I think that Putin looks out for his country. You're in a bar, and there's a bunch of Navy SEALs in one corner. There's a bunch of the British SAS in the other. Someone says the wrong thing. It all kicks off. Who wins? the owner of the bar because we're going to drink a lot of beers together. <laughs> it's great. We don't want to create our own brands. We want to sell what people already need and love. There's 300 million Amazon buyers, Prime subscribers, and there's less than 4 million sellers. <laughs> it, it's great to have you on our sense. Thank you so much uh, for sparing me the time. And I think jo you, Jocko is your nickname. John Gretton Willink Jr. is your, your full name. Um, you've had an extraordinary career because it's it's sort of split in half. One, you're this heroic Navy SEAL. 
And the other is life after that, which can be very difficult for people who leave the military. You know, my brother was a British Army officer, my brother-in-law the same. It's tricky to navigate your way out of the military into, into city street. You've done it incredibly successfully. And I think you've managed to do that because you've applied the same skill sets that you had in the military to civilian life to great effect. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think well, one thing that I, when I talk to veterans about getting out of the military and what they're going to do in their next phase of life, one of the most important things I think they need to do, and one of the things that I did was you have to find a new mission. So while you're in the military... Hey, uh, Jacko, what was your new mission in 2020? Sit on a podcast and pontificate the good old days in Iraq? Shit. He had the means to spill the beans on what was going on with the national security state, and he didn't do it. And oh, by the way, I'm pretty sure when you're in the military, you say an oath to the Constitution. That's your mission. So take some ownership, Jacko. I'm going to nickname him G.I. Joe. Of course, you have this mission, you're focused, you know what your job is, you have this long-term strategic goal of what you're trying to accomplish. And if you leave the military without finding a new mission, that can be problematic. And that's where I think sometimes guys get tripped up and they end up going down in a bad direction. But I found a new mission once I retired from the military and I started focusing on that. Jiu-Jitsu is one of your many skills. Um, you've been described as one of the most dangerous people alive. And there was a rumor that when you were a Navy SEAL, that you actually uh, tapped out 20 other SEALs in one jiu-jitsu session. Is that true? Well, I can understand where the rumor came from. So you got to remember, Pierce, I was very early into the jiu-jitsu game. I started training in 1992. And so I had a lot of advantages in the fact that I trained for a long time. And when you know jujitsu and you're going against people that don't know jujitsu, it's actually not that big of a deal to be able to beat them in that sport. Just like if you were a tennis player and I never played tennis before, you could beat me very easily. And then if I lined up 20 of my friends that had never played tennis before, you could beat them all very easily. And so it didn't make, it was nothing special about me. It was something special about jujitsu. So I trained jujitsu all the time. And when I was in a platoon, I would, train with the guys that didn't know anything and yes i'd be able to beat them but again it wasn't because i was tough it was just because i knew jiu-jitsu and they didn't these we were talking about not just average people these are other navy seals these are the most uh, strong highly disciplined aggressive warriors in the world and you're just taking them down highly disciplined uh they do some some of those people have been caught doing things they shouldn't have been doing, especially on the battlefield. Or after their after their career. So let's not put the special forces on a pedestal, Pierce. Because yes, they served their country. Yes, some of them, many of them served with dignity and honor. But you know, there are some things that Jocko could have revealed to the American public during the crisis in 2020 in terms of biological warfare. Like nine bits. Well, again, if you played me in tennis and you played tennis your whole life and I never played before, it wouldn't matter how big and strong and tough I was, you would obliterate me in the game of tennis. So jiu-jitsu is the same thing. It's a skill that you can learn. There's techniques, there's moves. And if you don't know the techniques, you're going to get beat, beat on, by people that do sense. know the techniques. So again, it was nothing about me being special. It's just that I happen to have been lucky enough to have trained jiu-jitsu for a, a while before that, before I was in that platoon training with those guys. So I think you, you did a TED talk where you talked very movingly about a, a frenzy fire incident in Iraq. And you, you talked about accountability there where you went around the room with other SEALs and other people who'd been taking part and asked them who's to blame for what happened for this, this uh, disaster which happened, which was a, a, a friendly fire. And everyone wanted to accept responsibility, all the other SEALs you talked to. But you wouldn't let them. In the end, you took responsibility 
yourself because you were the commanding officer. And I thought that was a great illustration of what real leadership is. But I was also impressed that so many of your team were prepared to put their hands up and also take responsibility. How important is that to any team that you have a guy at the top prepared to put his hand up? Special forces know about unconventional warfare. Why didn't SEAL teams have videos during the crisis talking about the biological and chemical warfare that they get trained with? Huh? Take responsibility, G.I. Joe. On their behalf and say, I'm, I'm the guy at the top. The buck stops with me. But also to have people strong-minded enough below you who also are prepared to admit when they get something wrong. That's absolutely critical for any winning team to have that attitude. And, and let me tell you what the, the opposite example is. The opposite example is where someone in a leadership position, instead of taking ownership when something goes wrong, they start pointing the fingers at other people and blaming them. You didn't do your part of the job. This was your fault. And what that causes, that causes the other people on the team to get defensive. And when those people start to get defensive because they're being blamed, they point their finger to someone else. And then that person points their finger at someone else. And what you end up with is a team where everyone. You ever ask the question why all the poultry farms are starting to go up in flames or granaries or cattle farms or cattle feed storage facilities for meat? Uh, guess what, guys? They're being targeted. And don't think that SEAL Team isn't doing it because they're just following orders. What if, I'm just making a proposition here. What if our government uses the special forces to do di domestic activities disrupting the food supply? You ever thought about that? Team is pointing their fingers at each other. They're blaming each other. No one is actually taking any ownership of the problems, and therefore the problems never get solved. So the opposite of that is when the leader does step up and take accountability and take ownership when things go wrong. And that is actually also contagious, and it allows other people to say, no, boss, actually. So with all that information that you have from the military, Jacko, I mean, G.I. Joe, all that information, you didn't have the whereabouts to take that mic in your big audience and say there's something nefarious going on with biological warfare. Especially in 2020. Or what about also in 2002? Now, let's take ownership, G.I. Joe. It's easy to write a book about how to improve your business and take ownership. That's easy. It's easy to do talk shows about the good old days in Iraq. But it's a lot harder to actually spill the beans on the national security state and how the special forces are tied to doing certain unconventional means of warfare and inform the public and inform Congress that we should be stopping this kind of activity. Instead, you want to protect your pension. So let's call it for what it is, Jocko. I mean, G.I. Joe. This is what I could have done better. This is what I could have done different. And then you end up with an entire team where everyone on the team is looking at a problem and trying to see what they could do to prevent that problem from happening again. And that's what I was lucky enough to have at growing up in that culture of the SEAL teams. And that's the way my task unit responded when we had issues inside that task unit. The other uh, cultural thing that you learned from the SEALs was about timekeeping. And in particular, what time to get out of bed. 
And I'm told that you had three watches. This was the advice of a badass Navy SEAL uh, guy. He said, you need three, three watches. One is, is electric powered, one is battery powered, and one's an old fashioned wind up one. Then you never have any excuse for missing an alarm call, a time you have to get out of bed. And you still, I believe, have the three watches and you set them for 4.30 in the morning, even though you have no real need to be out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, you do it out of habit. Is all that true? That is all true. Most wearables only track your heart rate during strength training, which tells you nothing about your muscles. That is all true. Yes, I get up early in the morning, and the reason that I ended up, began actually getting up early in the morning was I wasn't the best SEAL, I wasn't the smartest guy, I wasn't the strongest guy, I wasn't the best shot. And what I needed to do to level up to the people in my platoon was get to work a little bit earlier and work a little bit harder than them. And I found out that if I got to work a little bit earlier than them, then I could maybe keep up with them. And so I ended up getting in the habit of waking up very early and getting to work and getting a head start on the day so I could keep up with the, the rest of the guys in the teams. It just gives you the edge, right? Well, I'd say it kept me it kept me at the edge. I don't think it gave me any edge. Does it give you an edge in your life now? I mean, you're not in combat zones. It's not a matter of life and death. But having that steely discipline, having the ability to spring out of bed at 4.30 and attack the day. Uh, During the crisis, I went, I stayed up and recorded, you know, way early into the, early into the morning and then went to bed had about three or four hours of sleep and then started up again with the recording all right jacko i never saw you say anything about the unconventional warfare that was going on in 2020 i mean you're waking out of bed at 4 30 why didn't you you know decide to you know turn on a recording and say something audio video i don't know Smoke in the sky. Say something. Does that give you an edge in your life now, do you feel? I think that anybody that has the discipline to get up early in the morning and get started on their day before anyone else says, you're certainly going to have an advantage. If I've been up for two hours doing work before you show up, then I'm going to end up being more productive than you are. And if you multiply that times weeks and- Now let's think about that for a second. He's saying get up. Well, no, well, wait a minute here. It depends on how much sleep you're getting, Jacko. I mean, there is you know, a certain amount of sleep that you need to detoxify your body, solidify memory, have your body heal. By having sleep deprivation for the sake of waking up early in the morning is not productive. That's a fact. So even if you wake up early in the morning, that doesn't mean you're going to have the edge or, you know, have some more productivity compared to other people. It all depends on the amount of quality REM sleep you're getting. So that's the other side of the, of the equation here, Jacko. In years, I'm going to probably end up being a lot more productive than you are if you're sleeping in every morning and not rolling out of bed until the crack of 8.30. So yes, I believe that over time, if you get up early and you work hard, you will end up ahead. That being said, there's some people that are night owls and they do their best work you know, at two o'clock in the morning and they stay up until two o'clock in the morning and then they sleep in until 10. I think it's just a matter of finding a good schedule that works for you and then sticking to that schedule and getting your work done. It's a famous, uh, I think it has a lot to do with REM sleep, and if you're sleep deprived, you probably, if you're chronically sleep deprived, Jacko, you will probably have neurological deficit when you get older. Craven, where he talks, uh, who, uh, I, I imagine you may have even said on it, um, but he he talked about uh, the importance of getting up and making your bed. That even though it seems like a kind of insignificant thing to do. 
the discipline of making your bed in the morning, which obviously is ingrained into people in the military, but even in your civilian life, the, the small things like that give you the right mindset for the day. Yeah, true. Uh, I am married, and my wife does not get up at 4.30, so I do not make my bed at 4.30 <laughs> in the morning. But, you know, what Admiral McRaven talks about there is just making sure you, you accomplish a small task first thing in the morning. For me, I always exercise first thing in the morning, and I, I believe that's a great way to start your day and get your head in the right space and take care of the long-term strategic goal of staying healthy as a human being. So when I wake up in the morning, I quietly get out of bed, leave my wife alone, and then I go and exercise. You know, uh, Doctor, we live in a weird world now where a lot of young people, young men, seem to really struggle with life, with normal life stuff to deal with. They, they find themselves almost uh, unskilled in how to deal with life. Have you noticed this? What do we do about it? People need discipline. People need to get educated. People have to make their bed, pull up their pants, brush their teeth. They got to eat correctly, stay away from the GMO, proper supplementation, get proper sleep, and don't follow mandates. You know, I would say, Pierce, that I, I hear about that. But I don't see it when I go around and actually talk to people. So I have a consulting company. We do leadership consulting, and we work with all types of different industries, everyone from construction companies to energy companies to financial companies and everything in between. And so I'm out all the time talking to companies across the country, and I'm meeting these people. I'm meeting young men and young women that are out there, 20, 23, 25 years old, I meet them on job sites. I meet them in boardrooms. I meet them all the time. And you know what they're doing? They're working extremely hard. They're focused. They're trying to make things happen. That's what I see as I travel across America. I see people that are working really hard to make things happen. So I think there, there might be some static and some stray voltage about people that are having a hard time finding their way. I think those people have always existed. I mean, you can go watch movies from the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. There's always stories about people that are between the ages of 15 and 20 that are having a hard time figuring out what to do with their lives. And they exist today. But I don't think there are a preponderance of the people out there. I think most people are out there finding jobs and working really hard to make themselves and their world better. I've talked to uh, many great sportsmen, uh, many of whom have got extraordinarily confident personas. And I've always asked them, you know, is that really what you're like? Or do you go through the same kind of fears and concerns and nerves as everybody else? You just don't show us. And almost invariably, they say, yeah, we feel it. We just don't show it. They, they have a veneer which allows them not to show that they're nervous or fearful, be it footballers or cricketers or swimmers, whatever it may be, anyone involved in, in hard elite level competition. Um, what about you? I and mean, when you were a Navy SEAL, you're one of the most highly trained people in the world in terms of military. Did you experience real fear, nerves, before you went into battle? Yeah, so for me, there's really two components for that. And the, the number one question that you asked, did I feel fear and nervousness? The answer is absolutely. When you're going out on an operation, you, I would feel almost sick to my stomach with fear that one of my guys was going to get wounded or killed during an operation. That, that is a feeling that is very disturbing, and it's very hard to deal with. Now, that being said, and I talked about this on my podcast a while ago, I also had a, a little bit of a switch. And, and for me, for doing operations, it was actually the moment when we would start up our vehicles or the moment when I would put down my night vision goggles and then I would sort of flip a switch in my head where I would become very confident in what we had done to prepare for this operation and the confidence in the execution of the operation. I'd known that we had planned, we prepared, we trained. I know we'd done, I knew that we had done everything that we could to be ready to conduct this operation. 
I also knew that there were a couple things that we can't control. There are, there are certain parts of life, there are certain things in the world that we have no control over. And I would just cast those out of my brain. I wouldn't worry about them anymore. I would focus on the things that I could control, focus on the training and the preparation that we had done, and I would become very confident once we started to go out and execute that operation. And I feel that many sports people feel the same way. Listen, if you're arrogant and you think, oh, nothing will ever happen, we're, we're more than prepared to do this, well, then you might cut corners, then you might not train as hard, then you might not prepare as well. So you have to be humble when you're preparing for an operation. But when you actually go to execute an operation, you have to be confident and believe that you have prepared and planned and you're ready to execute this thing. Otherwise, it's going to be nerve-wracking and I don't even know how you would deal with that. War is about killing. Uh, Take my advice. To prepare and boost up your health, please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the great products that I have, like the structural nano silver drops in lozenges. I have it in blueberry for the drops, 100 count. I also have it in honey and lemon drops in the 100 count. This will soothe your throat, neutralize pathogens because it has structural nano silver. I also have lozenges that are in a 21 count. This is Manuka honey. Also, I have elderberry zinc. So structural nano silver lozenges, also in a 21 count. So please go to my store, low-studio-rakevic.com. We are getting to the tail end of the cold season. Some people still have some colds. So please stock up for your family on the drops and the lozenges. And also, we are going into the spring season, so there's going to be allergens and pollen that may, you know, aggravate your throat and your nose and, you know, and, you know, create um, some allergic kind of reactions to soothe that, that irritation in your throat, get the drops and the lozenges from my store, the dash studio dash .com. In addition, take the max 35 or the max 14. Take a teaspoon of it a day. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. You swish it in your mouth, you gargle, and you swallow. Um, and what you do, you do that every day, teaspoon of it a day to help neutralize pathogens and to in, improve your oral hygiene. By doing that, you're neutralizing the pathogens so your body isn't chronically fighting something and therefore your immune system is much better. Back to G.I. Joe. This is PNN. It's at its heart. That's what a war is. You as a Navy SEAL for 20 years or so, you, you would have presumably killed a lot of people and seen many of your colleagues killed. How do you deal with, with death, both deaths of people around you, friends, colleagues, and having to take other people's lives in combat, in war. Well, you said it, Pearson. I think a lot of times people forget this fact that what war is, is war is death. War is killing and it is being killed. And it's something that I think sometimes we, we go into wars thinking that we're going to somehow get through a war without killing people. And we're going to get through a war without having our own forces killed. So that is one of the most premier things we need to think about if we're going to engage in a conflict around the world. You've got to go into that with the will to go out there and kill the enemy. You also have to be, you, have, you also have to recognize the fact that going into a combat situation, there is a high probability, if not an absolute certainty, that civilians are going to be killed as well. And you've got to have that understanding that there's nothing that you can do that's going to prevent your own forces from being killed. That's what war is. So war is death. And when you're in war, you're going to deal with death. Unfortunately, I, I, I did lose my own guys. I lost many friends over the two decades of war that we fought. And it is a terrible thing to have to deal with. Two decades of war that we fought. And oh, by the way, we haven't won it. I did start to recognize a pattern when it came to dealing with death. And that is the, the initial shockwave of, oh, I've lost one of my friends, one of my brothers. 
and it's 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 a horrible gut wrenching feeling, and it's really waves of emotions that are going to hit you that are going to be very difficult to control, which is which is not something you're used to as a grown adult having emotions hit you that you're not able to control. And sometimes that can be very scary for people because all of a sudden for the first time in many years, they're in scenarios where they're getting emotional and they can't control their emotions. Now, what I learned over time was those emotions will eventually start to dissipate and the waves of emotion will become less frequent and they will also become less powerful over time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think sometimes people feel, oh, I, I don't feel as emotional as I used to. Am I a bad person? No, you're not a bad person. You're just learning to, you're learning to get through the loss of one of your friends. So I unfortunately experienced this many times, this, this, these waves of emotion that hit when you first lose someone in combat and then feeling those waves dissipate over the t over time. And, and I think that's actually what's supposed to happen. And, and I think when people are struggling with loss, which everyone's going to experience loss in their lives. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. If we're, if we're, we're going to, you're going to lose people that you love, family, friends, it's going to happen. And what you have to recognize is that those terrible emotions that you feel at first, they're going to dissipate over time, and that's okay. And you also have to recognize that it's not a good idea to dwell in the past, to, to constantly think about this loss that you've suffered. Instead, you have to remember you remember the people that you've lost, but you have to move forward. You have to move forward with your life. I can guarantee you right now, the, the friends and brothers that I lost, the absolute last thing that they would want me to do would be to sit around for the rest of my life and, and mourn for their loss. In fact, the absolute opposite is true. What they would want me to do would be to go out and live the best possible life I can, and that's what I try and do. What was the closest you came to? What you should have done during 2020 was inform the public about unconventional warfare in chemical and biologics, Chaco. Being killed in action. Probably just getting, I had no idea the water filters I've been using forever were so terrible. I know I need to filter my water, but a countertop filter just always seemed like overkill. But I was watching. Probably just getting hit with mortars or just getting hit by machine gun fire. I mean, you're you're out. You know, the, the last deployment I did was in the Battle of Ramadi in 2006. And when you're out in the street, you're going to hear rounds going over your head. I had mortars hit very close to me and, and, and kill people that were in my proximity. So probably those situations... What goes through your mind? I mean, does anything, obviously you're involved in combat, it's different to, to I guess, civilians having near-death experience, but people often talk about, you know, the life flashing the ball. Did you ever have that? No, I never really had my life flash before my eyes. You, you, what you're focused on in those situations is you're focused on doing your job. And you're focused on, hey, where am I going to maneuver my troops to? Hey, is everyone else okay? Hey, did I get a head count to make sure no one got hit? Those are the things you're focused on when you're in combat. I was never in a situation where I was sitting there having my life flash before my eyes. I was always sitting there trying to figure out what our next move was going to be. Do you sleep well? Or and I hear from many ex-servicemen, they find just sleep hard. That a lot of stuff comes back at night. I have some dreams that are maybe not the most pleasant dreams to have, but I wake up, shake it off, and try and go back to sleep. <laughs> How easy is that? Sometimes it's a little tricky, but I, I think more of the time when I can't sleep, it's just because I'm, I'm focused on the things I want to do, the, the, the places I want to go, the, the things that I have to do. That's what I, that's what I think about. I'm, I'm not... I'm not dwelling on the past or, or dwelling on situations that are no longer under my control. I can't imagine anyone would be this stupid, but does anyone ever try and pick a fight with you? <laughs> I haven't had anybody try and pick a fight with me in quite some time. And it wouldn't end well for them, would it? That's... 
Well, you know, in this day and age, you never know what you're going to get. And some knucklehead could pick a fight with you and you square off with him and then, you know, he stabs you in the neck. So uh, I, I think people avoid fighting with me and, and I do my best to avoid fighting with other people. Are you a, an emotional guy? I mean, when was the last time you cried? God, what a dumbass question. I mean, come on. Every lunch for the past two months, I've been eating yeah. Huel Instant No Cups and it's changed the game for me. It's as easy as instant ramen, but much, much tastier. Plus, it has all 20... I would say the last time I cried is the last funeral that I went to for one of my friends. And then, as I said, there's waves of emotion that, that I, I can get hit with. Um, you know, I, I talk about the fact that sometimes when I hear the national anthem of the United States of America, sometimes that brings tears to my eyes. I have a lot of memories of the sacrifices that have been made for that flag. And so sometimes when I hear the national anthem at a sporting event, I'll get a tear in my eye. And so am I an emotional person? I, I can tell you that I don't make decisions based on emotions. I mean, I put the, the, I put the emotions into the calculus of decision-making, but I don't make decisions based on my emotions. But am I an emotional person? Do I cry? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of role models out there for, for young men in particular, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, uh, too. Uh, Andrew Tate is another one. What's your view of Tate? Do you think he's a force for good or, or not? I, I actually have not met him before. I've, I've met, obviously, I've met Jordan Peterson many times. I've met Joe Rogan many times. And both those guys, when people ask me about what, what they're like, I can tell you that what they're like is is what you see. And and they both are very helpful, very positive people with great, uh, I think, great input for other people to follow. Uh, but I've never met Andrew Tate before. I, I know who he is, but I, I've never met him before. And so I, I couldn't really assess what his situation is. I, I, I know there's some level of controversy around him, but I, I don't know enough about it that I could fairly assess whether he is a, a a force for good or not i don't i don't know enough about him the what was he heading towards a big election in america what, what's your view about the state of your country at the moment well again pierce luckily for me i, I had the opportunity to travel around the country and i and i meet people all the time and when I travel around the country and I meet people and I talk to people, sure, are there some fringe people that want to talk about politics and are extremely passionate, even borderline totally insane because of politics? Yes, there are those people. They do exist in America. And those are the ones that are the loudest, especially on social media. But when I go out and travel the land and interact with people, what we talk about is how to move forward, how to improve their business, how to improve their profitability, how to take care of their workers, how to grow. But he's going as a consultant to these companies. Of course, it's going to be centric to that. Everywhere I go, it's always orange man bad and, and Biden good in New York. There's so many liberals in New York. It's, I'll tell you, the polarization ever since Trump you know, was elected in 2016, right? You know, and it's just been never ending. Trump is negative. All policies from him are bad, blah, 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 blah. And the, de the Democrats are so good. So I don't know what world he's in. It must be an insular world. What people talk about with me so I think that we are getting a, a little bit of a false impression of what America at large is like, because I think America at large is normal people out there doing normal things. And I think that social media has given a voice to a small number of people who are extremely loud and extremely extreme as well. And that's where they get the most... Um, that's where that's where people get the most likes and clicks and everything. I'll do another video on it. But I was privileged to see a lecture on Thursday. 
at the Harvard Club by uh, Miss Austin. She happens to be a lawyer and she's the daughter of one of the founding individuals that worked with MLK during the civil rights movement. And she happens to be on the reparations committee for New York state. She's working for the governor for reparations. Uh, wake up, Jocko, wake up. There's a divide that's taking place in this country where they're gonna force huge payments in some kind of way, probably a multi multitude of ways for reparations. So it's not average citizens doing average things. Wake up, Jacko, just like you should have woken up in 2020. G.I. Joe, that's what you get. Always after the fact. But when I go out and talk to normal human beings across this country, they're they're not they're not wrapped up in politics. They're trying to improve their world for their family and their for and for their community. When you're in the military, obviously you just do what your government and president tell you to do. President's the commander in chief. When you look at Joe Biden, uh, who many people feel is not really in control of his faculties these days, and you look at Donald Trump, who you know, people love or hate, and he's facing all these criminal charges and so on. Which one would you feel more comfortable taking orders from? What? I saw war. I saw moving. I saw shooting. Well, as you said, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure when I look at Joe Biden that Joe Biden is the person that is that is coming up with plans or figuring out what to do with the country. It, it certainly doesn't seem that way. I, I, I just don't, when I hear him talk, when I hear him communicate, I, I don't really see cohesive thought. So I, I'm sure there's some kind of people behind the scenes that are that must be making decisions. Donald Trump, um, you know, he's a very, a very blunt communicator, but I think it is, you know, I think there's really no doubt that when, when Donald Trump speaks, it's Donald Trump that is talking, sometimes right. for the better, sometimes for the worse. I think he gets himself in trouble a lot. Uh, but as far as those two, and if I was in the military, I, I would probably lean towards having somebody that what actually had the cognitive capacity to understand what was happening and make decisions a little bit more with a clear mind than, than someone that is probably at a point in their life where their cognitive capacity is really failing. So it would be Trump. Yeah, I, I guess if you're putting these two people up, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden, again, it doesn't seem like Joe Biden has the, the clearest thought at this juncture in his life. So... Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to follow someone that, that wasn't making good decisions or clear decisions with their own cognitive abilities. There are various wars raging at the moment, sadly, as there often are, of course. I um, just want to ask your, your view about where you think we are with them. Obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been two years now. There is a growing belief in some quarters that Ukraine can't beat Russia and should do some kind of deal where they would let Putin keep the land he grabbed. Uh, seems to me that, that, to me, it flies in the face of what most Americans historically would have thought about what you should do with a Russian dictator. That if a Russian dictator invades a, a sovereign democratic country and takes a lot of land, it's the duty of the rest, the West, to stop him, not just let him take what he wants. What do you say? Well, when you say the duty of the West, does that mean we send American men and women over there 
to fight against the Russians? Is that what you're no, talking I would about? No, I would say you ramp up sending the Ukrainians the military hardware they would need to actually repel the Russians. Well, I think you're going to have to try and figure out uh, a, a better solution than just sending everyone into a bloodbath to get to get killed. That you know this this war has been really vicious, and I think at a certain point, this is a war of attrition. This isn't this isn't maneuver warfare. It's not guerrilla warfare. The way the Ukrainians are fighting this, it's it's attrition warfare. Every war that went through that region has been attrition. It's history. It's a, 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 po a huge population of Russia against a smaller population of Ukraine. And you're eventually, they're going to run out of people. So supplying people with weapons, although that can bolster them up for a, a time period, eventually you got to figure out some kind of a, a rational solution where you can you can bring about peace and, and make some kind of a compromise so that we can stop killing each other. What do you think of Putin? I think that Putin looks out for his country. And I think that that is what he's going to continue to do. I think that he probably is a little bit on his back feet or on his heels a bit, because I think this, this invasion of Ukraine was ended up being a lot harder than he thought it was going to be. And so, and I doubt he's willing to sacrifice that many more people. So I think given the right circumstances, he could come to the table to negotiate some kind of uh, peace there. And when you look at the situation with Israel and their war with Hamas, and in particular, the, the collateral damage of so many civilians, particularly children, getting killed in, in the process of trying to eliminate Hamas, what do you feel about that from a, from a moral perspective as a former SEAL? Do you think it's a fair fight, what's happening there? Do I think it's a fair fight that's happening in Gaza at this time? You know, I saw, I saw a video clip the other day, Pierce, of some Israeli soldiers that were moving down the street in Gaza. And as I was watching them move down the street, I... Remember that, that feeling I told you you get in your gut of that gut-wrenching, horrible feeling when someone's going to get wounded or killed? As I was watching these Israeli soldiers move down the street, I, I got that feeling. And I recognize that what these Israeli soldiers are feeling is that. They're going into Gaza. They're trying to get it cleared out. And what's interesting about Israel is the, the government officials, the leaders of Israel, they've had that feeling as well. I know what that feeling is. But the leaders of Israel know what that feeling is, is as well. And so they don't want to put their troops into that situation. They don't want, they don't, it's not worth it to them. And so what are they doing? They're being very heavy handed with airstrikes. This is a really good point that G.I. Joe is saying. We have elected officials making decisions that really haven't been in similar circumstances. And this is the problem when you bring on lawyers to represent you in government and not military experienced individuals. There's a ton of collateral damage. And I think their, their feeling is, hey, we are willing to do some collateral damage to protect our people. And I think that's why you're, you're getting this amount of collateral damage. And I think that once, the, once Israel gets to a point where they feel like Hamas has been significantly neutralized, I think they're going to put the brakes on, and I think they're going to do their best to try and bring back some level of humanity to Gaza. Will it be too late at that point? I'm not sure. This is the, this is the horrible thing about war is the only the only thing that explains what will happen at the end of a war is what happens at the end of a war the the people of gaza well, how are they going to react how are they going to how are they going to settle in if all of a sudden israel starts trying to help them rebuild have they been 
battered to a point where they won't ever accept that type of situation? Or have they been battered to a point where they say, you know what, we've had enough. We don't, we don't want Hamas here. We want to live normal lives. Let's, let's cooperate. How is that going to end up, Pierce? I do not know. It's a mess, isn't it? I mean, in, in terms of that whole region, this is a real mess. Yeah, it's 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 very it's biblical, it's metaphysical, it's the battle between Jacob and Esau that's been going on for a thousand for thousands of years. You can't use standard logic nor international policy when solving this issue in the Middle East. Very unpredictable. It's very unpredictable. And especially for us sitting on the outside, no, as, no, no, no. as the when whole... you look at a chaotic system, all right, it may seem based on your perspective that it's chaotic. But if you put it into a into a one additional dimension or two additional dimensions, then you start to understand the system. Perfect example: if you're seeing a movement of a particle in two D, it looks chaotic. But if you if you look at it in three dimensions, it's more understandable on how that particle is moving in three dimensions, right? So adding dimensionality to the system that you're looking at that seems to be chaotic, right? Um, will give you a better understanding in the higher dimensionality. And this is what's happening with the Middle East. To solve the problem in the Middle East, you have to look at it from the metaphysical dimension also. And when you do that, then you start to see how this is playing out. But the war planners don't want to use metaphysics. Well, sitting on the outside, trying to look at it and trying to understand the propaganda from both sides, trying to decipher what all that means is, is very difficult. And as you, as you said, it's a mess. Okay, we've had a fascinating conversation. I want to just end with some stuff about you. I know you've been married to your wife, Elena, for a long time. You have four children. Um, it can be very difficult to juggle being a Navy SEAL with love and marriage and kids and everything. Uh, how successful have you been at that, do you think? Well, I've been married for, I think, 27 years. I have four kids. They're all great kids. And, you know, the credit goes, obviously, to my wife. She she was the one that was sitting at home taking care of the kids when I was on deployment. She was, you know, getting the water heater repaired, getting the, getting the oil changed in the cars. She was handling all the finances, and she was raising all those kids at the same time while I was on deployment. I, quite frankly, when I was on deployment. This part of the video makes me sleepy. Right. And if you are having a problem with sleep in getting those th three REM cycles that you need, don't follow Jocko's get up at 430 in the morning protocol. Go to my store, the dash studio dash Reykjavik.com and get the good night formula. It has tryptophan and melatonin in it. It'll allow you to get those three cycles of REM sleep by getting regular REM sleep. What will happen is your body will start to detox especially the central nervous system and you will start to consolidate memories and by doing that you're going to have more mental acuity you're going to be better well rested you'll have more atp because your system is rested and it, in addition you're getting rid of toxins there's research that's out there that chronic deprived sleep will lead to decreased mental acuity in earlier uh, signs of dementia later in life. So don't follow his protocol. Make sure you get sleep. And if you're having problems getting sleep, go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the good night formula. Take it to be able to get that regular sleep. You can take it every day, but the key is to get the REM sleep, the, the REM cycle sleep. Multivitamins, you need a high quality multivitamin, and, which this is, and this is easy to digest, so it's not harsh on your stomach. And by taking this every day, you're going to have the cofactors that will 
that are needed for enzymatic activity. The cofactors that are in here, the minerals and the vitamins, what is important is to have the right concentration to be able to have the proper enzymatic activity so you will have that cellular function working in its prime. If you don't take a multivitamin, especially a good one, what will happen is, is that your cells are gonna run suboptimal. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the multivitamin. I also have a B-complex supplement on my store. So also get the B-complex. The reason why you need B-complex and the multivitamin is, is that you don't wanna have macrocytic anemia, people that are deprived in, in B12, can get macrocytic anemia. And to have a really high functioning mitochondria, you need B1, B2, B3, B4, B5 vitamins. So here's just a perfect example that you need these cofactors for proper enzymatic activity, proper uh, ATP cre creation in the mitochondria. So please go to the store and get the multivitamin. Also, to boost up your immune system, you're going to need to take daily magnesium and zinc. And if you're not feeling well, take a double dose. It'll help to improve your immune system. Now what I want to do is I want to um, I want to take a look at this. There was, maybe, maybe, I want to play a video that I saw on Thursday, all right, and it's pretty impressive, so let's, let's play it, all right. We really want to welcome you into the beating heart of this organization now, and you've had some fantastic models already. Uh, of what great citizen leaders look like. You've had a, a really good look at the kind of people that we are going to invest in you so that you can become. I'm going to turn over to Joe. He's going to I'm going to play a, few a shorter video that's of the same topic. Yeah. Newsletter subscriptions and receive notifications when your favorite publications, broadcasts, and podcasts go live. Bookmark articles, essays, and multimedia for later viewing. Take the step to create a MyHoover account now and transform the way in which you acquire this valuable knowledge. The suppression of free speech, the rigid imposition of the narrow ideology, and the rise of anti-Semitism. German universities between the wars and American universities today. Historian Neil Ferguson on Uncommon Knowledge now. now. It's a background story because when you come to Dr. Paul Cottrell's channel, you you know want to hear the background story, right? I have met him twice. Uh, it was at IMET. Um, back in the day when I was doing the economic conferences and, you know, from that thing. But uh, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, I love his books. I have a lot of his books. He's my go-to when it comes to that intersection between history and economics. And unfortunately, I, would, I did not, I, I wish I did, but I didn't take a course when he was teaching at at Harvard, um, he was there at Harvard t for 12 years. Um, obviously, he was in a different department, and that's part of the reason. But um, but uh, it's a shame, you know. He left Harvard and he went to Stanford, and then now he's part of the Hoover Institute. And now he's setting up. He's he's a, a chair or a founding member of a new university. So um, he's a fascinating guy. And I've been watching him for many, many years, many, many years, even before he went up to, to Harvard as a professor. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A fellow at the Hoover Institution, Neil Ferguson received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees from Oxford. Before coming here to Stanford, he held posts at Oxford, Cambridge, NYU, Harvard, and the London School of Economics. Professor Ferguson is the author of more than a dozen major works of history, 
including The Pity of War, Explaining World War I, I've read and Kissinger, The Idealist, the first volume of his projected two-volume biography of the late Henry Kissinger. Our topic today, the essay Professor Ferguson published just last month, The Treason of the Intellectuals. Neil, welcome. Good to be with you, Peter. Neil Ferguson in the Free Press, December 10th, quote, for nearly 10 years, I have marveled at the treason of the person that he looks up to was actually James Bond, the original James Bond, Sean, Sean Connery. So that's why there's a little bit of Sean Connery-esqueness about him. But he's also Scottish, so. Fellow intellectuals. Throughout that period, friends have assured me that I was exaggerating. Who could possibly object to more diversity, equality, and inclusion on campus? Such arguments fell apart after October 7th, close quote. Let's take that bit by bit. The treason of your fellow intellectuals. You're, of course, playing on a famous essay by a Frenchman in 1920-something or other, La Trison des Clairs. That's right. But you use the word treason of your own experience of your fellow academics. What exactly are they betraying? When Bender wrote that book, which is usually translated as Treason of the Intellectuals, uh, in, in interwar France, uh, he was talking about uh, what seemed to him a great betrayal of academics and intellectuals uh, uh, by siding with the political right. And so when one uses the phrase today, uh, the initial response is one of shock. People say, but surely today's academics are on the left. Why would you want to invoke uh, the spirit of, of, uh, of Bindar and, and the interwar period? And the answer is that it's a betrayal of your uh, role as a professor or, uh, or for that matter, a public intellectual, if you pursue a specific political goal, pretending that you're engaged in an academic activity. Uh, let me go even further back in time. Max Weber, uh, perhaps the founder of sociology and a great German thinker, uh, gave a, a memorable lecture more than 100 years ago in which he argued that there should be a clear distinction between politik and wissenschaft, between politics and science, or let's call it uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that is the betrayal. When you forget about that separation and use your privilege which you have uh, as a professor to pursue a political agenda and it doesn't matter whether you're leaning to the right in your politics or to the left it's treason to the ideals of the university to mottos like uh, veritas uh, or de uh, if you use your position to engage in political activism. And the generation of academics in America today are as guilty of that treason as the generation of academics between the wars who align themselves with the far right. You, you, you say this for nearly right. 10 so, years. So what's interesting with the history of Harvard, and um, maybe I'll do a critique of a couple of books that I've read about this um, era at Harvard, but it was more, it, obviously it was conservative much before it turned super liberal. And so, you know, they, many people that were going there in the late 1800s, um, early 1900s, they were uh, conservative individuals and they were actually trying to trust uh, they were trying to bust some of these labor unions they were certain to pop up, uh, especially around the 19, the 1950, you know, probably around 19, 19 to 1925 or so. And they actually had a phrase at, at Harvard at, the, at that time, and that was protect your class. And they didn't mean protect your class, uh, you know, of the student body. They mean the class that they were coming from, socioeconomically. 
And so these conservative students were trying to bust the, these labor units. Now, fast forward to the Vietnam era and it became super liberal. And fast forward from the 1960s all the way to the 2020s. And you have something in the order of, you know, probably 5X, uh, so, you know, times more uh, liberal activity, maybe even more, uh, in the student body, especially with the professors. So there is this, this shift where you had pre kind of, we'll go like pre, um, pre-Civil War era at Harvard. And then, um, you know, that, 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 that had a different student body, probably was not very political, all right? Uh, and in the early days of the university, it was, it was for the clergy. And then eventually, um, the, the, the founding of the country, you know, it's this, you know, 1776, right? So you had this, you know, new era, but still intellectual, but it did have a political component to it because part of Harvard was for the king and part of it was not. And it wasn't until later where they switched over. Um, and then this idea of masculinity uh, right after or during the Civil War, during the Civil War, the American Civil War, so, you know, 1861, and even post-Civil War for the, you know, the students that didn't uh, fight in the war um, or parents that didn't fight in the war, there was uh, this kind of sense of, not participating in the grand experiment of, of America. And there was this, if you didn't participate in the Civil War, then there wasn't this masculine aspect. So during this period of time at, at Harvard, that's when you had more emphasis on sports. So there was this coupling between scholarship and sports. So the masculinity, because it was all men's school at the time, and then Radcliffe was a school, but it wasn't integrated completely to with Harvard yet for the women. But um, as this is happening, uh, there was this push for sports, masculinity, scholarship, and service to country. It was kind of a very conservative mindset, right? Uh, that led right into World War One, right? And many Harvard students and, and alumnus fought in the war and many died actually. Uh, and then you had this time period between the two wars, wars that he's talking about between 1918 to about, um, you know, when America gets into the war, 1940s, 41. So, but during this period of time, there was kind of a, um, there was a politicalization that was going on and there was a, a, a conservative right-wing aspect that was starting to emerge. There's history between the Nazi party and Harvard. Um, and, you know, there's actually some pictures of some of the prominent um, military establishment in Germany uh, you know, Nazi Germany coming to Harvard for a, a football game. There's a picture of it. I think this is in the 1930s. So, and then what was going on in finance at that time in America was the funding of the Nazi party through the fam, you know, one of the families was, was the Bushes, you know, out of a bank, out of, out of New York. So, So you had this kind of like, there was a politicization that was going on that he's, he's mentioning. And there's this large arc that's going on at Harvard from 1636 all the way, you know, to the American Revolution, through the American Revolution, then that time period between the American Revolution to the Civil War, and the, the increase in, uh, in uh, service to country and, and 
that coupling between scholarship and sports, that's all kind of happening post-Civil War, right? And that leads us right into the First World War and then that intermediate period where there was this element of fascism and conservatism that was starting to take hold. And um, to prevent the, the, the liberal movement. And then that kind of dies down. And right after World War II, then you had this large, large, large working together between universities like Harvard and the government. All right. During World War I and World War II, there were the officer corps and the ROTC that was taking place. Uh, so many officers were being funneled from Harvard into the military, all right? So there was already a government relationship with Harvard, right, during World War I and World War II. So right after World War II, there was this, the regional study starts to take hold and the CIA starts to happen and the funding that starts to, to, to flow into Harvard and even MIT with some of the you know, the inventions and discoveries that MIT was doing. And this leads to DARPA and all this, all this stuff that's going on in, in Massachusetts and especially in Cambridge. So there's this large arc, right? That people need to kind of, it's not just the liberal movement now that was taking place in academia. There was a period of time where it was conservative but especially during the period between the wars where there was elements of actually fascism that was taking place. Treason, my fellow intellectuals. You've been an academic. I'm very sorry to say that I actually spent a moment or two counting up, you know, but you got your doctorate more than three decades ago, and you've been a public intellectual at least since the moment that first book on the First World War became an international bestseller. That's a while ago. What happened 10 years ago? Well, it was almost 10 years ago that I think my wife and I, Ayanhersi Ali and I, came into contact with cancel culture for the first time. And that was when she was invited to give uh, a commencement address at Brandeis University. And then shortly before the event was told that she was disinvited because a strange coalition of progressive uh, and Islamist uh, elements at Brandeis. at Brandeis had signed a petition uh, demanding that she be disinvited. Uh, and it was at that stage that cancel culture began to be something of a recurrent phenomenon in universities in the United States. People were being disinvited. And I remember digging into it and, and trying to understand what was going on and be kind of mystified by this unholy alliance between and uh, this is where it's really important where the universities was is a is a place for discussion of different views but when one side is trying to monopolize the argument and when the university doesn't have an equal representation of the political spectrum within their faculty then it becomes problematic Uh, gay rights activists and Islamists who thought that somebody uh, like my wife should be publicly uh, humiliated, as of course she was, to be disinvited publicly uh, in that way. And, that, and I think that's when I began to worry that something was going wrong. And I spotted it going wrong at that time at Harvard, where I was a professor. Uh, and I began to talk about this curious illiberal turn that I was observing. Uh, and it is in the space of about 10 years that what you might call wokeism has gone from being a fringe uh, fashion to being the dominant oh, ideology oh. of the major universities, so dominant that it has led uh, to appointments like uh, the now former president of Harvard, Claudine Gay, somebody who would never have been put in that position uh, in, in the previous decades. So, so one last bit of that opening quotation. Friends assured me that I was exaggerating such arguments, their arguments, the friends' arguments, fell apart after October 7th. You were talking about a phenomenon that you have been tracking 
for a decade that you became very public about a number of years ago. Why was the response to October 7th different? Why then? I think for many American Jews uh, who had perhaps been at Harvard or Stanford or Yale or Princeton and left many years ago and got on with their lives, whether it was in technology or, or finance, in the real world, for them it was a tremendous shock to see more than 30 Harvard student groups issue a statement. For me, all right, because I graduated from my master's at Harvard through HES in biology field um, concentration. Uh, that was in 2022. And, you know, I, my classes started in 2017. So it was from 2017, you know, to the very beginning of 2022. That was my era the Harvard era, um, I noticed while I was on campus that there was this very strong fringe group that I would call communistic, all right? And it was a combination of, um, it, was, it, it, it was kind of this like uh, very ultra liberal, communistic, that had strong ties to like a black power movement, all right? This is before, when I noticed this, this is way before BLM, all right? Started popping up, all right? Now, um, so I would, you know, it's, there's this ultra liberal communistic BLM kind of thing going on on campus. And they would post on the bulletin board in Seaver Hall, you know, activities to, you know, to on a certain day show up at whatever. Or when you're walking through the different gates, there there's like the South Gate and then, you know, West Gate and all this stuff. So at the gates, there are like these pillars that people can post, especially right out of the science building. This, because I was going in and out of the science building all the time, because that was where my lectures were primarily. And I had lectures also in Seaver Hall. So um, the the pillar that they would do their posting the bills for was right as you are by the gate, as you're going through the gate into the yard, it would be on the right side where the, the bills would be posted. And they were, you know, there were these communistic kind of postings that, that you know, to meet up at whatever. And so it's easy for these things to, you know, get out of control. Uh, what I saw on campus regularly was smaller protests dealing with Tibet and um, uh, and um, dealing with uh, you know Chinese activity uh, with Taiwan those were the kinds of things that I saw um, on a regular basis it was usually they they usually were protesting they had these small protests right in front of the Starbucks in Harvard Square at that time, Starbucks now moved over the over to the, to the other corner of the street and where Starbucks used to be when I was a student at Harvard is now, um, the Har I think it's the Harvard shop. So, um, you know, I remember seeing these things popping up. So, you know, this, this, this uh, wokeism this ultra liberal wokeism slash communist. The reason why I, I put it in this this category of communism is is that they want to shut down other people's speech, other people's thought processes. They're also the element that's trying to to die, force universities with their endowment to divest in certain types of things and invest into certain types of things. So this is the same group that is pushing for ESG and to divest in fossil fuels uh, from these portfolios. Now, people don't realize many portfolios perform much better when they invest in energy. Uh, and by the way, many pensions have invested in energy. 
So, you know, this by divesting, they were hurting pensioners. But, you know, they were trying to save the planet. There's an agenda that was being pushed. Impressionable people that had this kind of like uh, activist mentality that wanted to shut down other viewpoints running the student bodies. I saw that from from 2017 to, to 2022. And it's probably much worse now. I never saw really a Palestinian Israeli issue. There might have been, you know, really at the fringes, but it was more about like ESG, fossil fuel, um, anti Trump kind of stuff that I saw. Oh, an abortion. It's condoning Hamas's atrocious uh, behavior, the violence, the rape, the, uh, the atrocities of October the 7th, well, the slaughter. And that in the wake of those public statements, the university authorities at Har and elsewhere seemed unable to uh, express anything uh, beyond uh, lame bromides. I think that was the moment that many American Jews realized that something had indeed gone terribly wrong. Uh, they, they found themselves marveling that 30 student groups, more than 30, should explicitly condone an act of terrorism. And then they realized that pro-Palestinian elements were so uh, dominant uh, in universities and amongst young people generally, that there was a new anti Semitism that they hadn't realized was there the anti Semitism of the, the woke left. And this was a great shock to people who'd not been paying attention. Uh, and so the only good thing that came to October the 7th, the only good thing was that it made people in the United States and elsewhere in Britain to realize that the Anglosphere as a whole has a major problem with a new kind of anti-Semitism and it is entrenched amongst young people and it's entrenched because the universities have been teaching a particular brand of, of politics and history uh, that depicts Israel as just the latest manifestation of settler colonialism and portrays Palestinians as the latest victims of uh, white supremacy, of which somehow the Jews have become the leading exponents, because that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. Onto the onto the heart of the essay, the Jew, that remarkable essay you published on the center. And this dovetails into the lecture that I saw with Miss Austin, that's doing the reparations for the governor of New York as the com as a as a committee chair. They want this movement that's kind of communistic, BLM-ish movement. They want to create the haves, the have-nots. They want to create this idea of individuals that benefited from the suffering of others and the ones that are suffering, All right? That way they can usher in policies to try to take away power from the ones that are, in their mind, orchestrating structural racism and move wealth to the group that is suffering. In their case, they're pushing reparations for the Black community. So they want to create this division. They have to create the division. Because if the division, if, if the perception is that the division doesn't exist, then how are you going to push reparations? You have to have the division to push the policy. So there is this, there is this element that's going on, on on the university campuses, pushing DEI and gender, you know, these gender studies and racial studies and all this that's creating this divide between male, female, black, white, Arab, and G Jew or Christian. And they create these divides, the oppressed and the oppressor, right? 
and they're trying to put as many people that have influence and power and money in the in the category of the oppressor and try to tax them or punish them in some way socially economically that's what's going on in america i'm not sure if it's happening around the world it might be but there may be some unique feature to it because of the history of slavery you know going all the way back to you know the early colonial times right but this is going to divide in my estimation they are as they're dividing the country it's not going to rectify the wrongs of slavery what it's going to do is, is it's going to enhance more racism because the ones that are the oppressor in their eyes the oppressor they're going to think that they're being attacked by the oppressee the oppressed and they're going to have it's going to become more animalistic what's going to happen is, is there's going to be a fight or flight response there's going to be a digging in that they don't want to they they won't want to assimilate and even miss austin the lecturer you know on on thursday about this subject she um you know agreed that you know getting giving the black community a payment now this person is a lawyer right she's a black woman she is established she is doing well for herself but she per, she puts herself in the oppressed category all right but she even mentions that giving a check isn't going to solve the problem she doesn't go far enough that if giving a check to the black community what's going to happen is is that's going to be additional racism that didn't exist in this day of age I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist in some pockets of the world and in some pockets of the United States, there's racism. I question the idea that there's structural racism. Structural racism definitely happened in the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, but we don't have structural racism today. Or if you're using the, the word structural racism, it's a different definition than it was post you know, uh, uh, a different definition compared to pre-Civil War. Maybe the definition that they're using is, you know, it has moved and it has morphed and evolved. But she even admits that just giving a check isn't going to change it because it's about social economic conditions. And there are social economic issues too. But that's not just the black community. It's also the Hispanic community. Community. It's also the, the the working poor community and the white community. It's about socioeconomic issues and being able to fund programs to enhance education and and job skills for this community is what's needed for all, independent of their black, white, whatever. But just sending a check because of some sort of structural racism isn't going to solve the problem. They're only going to ask for more because they're going to say it's still structural because they didn't solve the problem. And she even is admitting to this, this fact that just giving a check isn't going to solve the problem, that you're going to have to get to the, some of these root causes. And that many of it is, is socioeconomic. Where she gets it wrong is, is that it's, it's primarily in the black community. And I don't think so. I think it's primarily in the poor community. I think it's independent of, of race. And so they keep on citing people that are pushing the DEI agenda, pushing the reparation agenda, but not citing people like Sowell and, and uh, Rollin, which is proving that the DEI agenda is a canard. And that you know the data is proving that it's not about race. It's about giving these children the opportunities early for education and a safe environment so they're not gang bangers. And that, that special attention early in life is so important. It's not about the big check, but 
the community, the black community in general wants, not all, all of it, but a big part of it, uh, wants that big payout. And we're talking about 20, the numbers that are starting to be thrown out are around $25 to $50,000 per head. Now, if we have 14% of the population or 16% of the population that's black, uh, that's trillions of dollars. That's that Americans can't afford. And so it becomes inflationary. So the poor become even more poor because of reparations. See, this is a failed economic policy, just like most liberal policies are failures economically and socially. But no one else, no one else, I was about to say, in this country, in any country, could have published because nobody else has the depth of historical knowledge and the intellectual audacity to draw the parallels. We'll come to all this, but let me quote, get onto the essay. I'm quoting the essay again. It might be thought extraordinary that the most prestigious universities in the world should have become infected so rapidly with a politics imbued in, with anti Semitism. Yet exactly the same thing has happened before. Academically educated Germans were unusually ready to prostrate themselves before a charismatic leader. Lawyers and doctors, all credentialed with university degrees, were substantially overrepresented within the Nazi party, as were university students, close quote. So if you were looking for characteristics that predicted membership in the Nazi party, you would have looked at educational attainment. That is correct. How can that have been? Well, it, it, first, let's go back to... There are different soul roots for different countries, all right? And I explain that, you know, there are this... You have Esau and Ishmael and Jacob, right? And there's different compositions, right? And there's the 70 nations. Well, Germany is one of those, you know, they're, they're coming from that soul root of one of those nations, which number, I don't know, what's their composition, I don't know. But, but the, the point here is, is that on a Kabbalistic level, all right, and I've heard of this from a pretty well-known rabbi, um, that the problem with the German people is, is that you can philosophize and build a, a thinking of legitimacy around a concept. And if you are a very highly technological people like the Germans with not as much morality, you can do it atrocious things. So it's this lack of morality, but Uber intelligent, uber sophisticated, uber skilled, where you can rationalize it. So this is where Nietzsche comes in, all right? So on a Kabbalistic level, the sole root from Germany is, yes, you can get highly educated, highly sophisticated, very productive society to do things that is that are not moral. Now you can have a very, and you can be on the other side of the spectrum where they're not sophisticated, they're not, you know, technologically advanced, but highly moral, and you know, that's the whole, uh, another set of problems. But you, with the Germans, there was a lack of foundation of morality that you could philosophize yourself into justification and create laws and you know and it built on a certain philosophy so this is the this is the the plus and the minus to philosophy you got to understand the the theoretical framework and that how it's built and how it's followed and is it you know is it in bettering society or is it not and what's the morality compass of, of that philosophy. Case in point, the 1920s, 1930s, the 1940s, even the 1910s in Germany was this beginning, 
right, of this justification of atrocities through a theoretical framework that that through logic they could justify. They're wrong. I mean, obviously, you know, history proved that. But the you know the point here is is that there's a similarity. You have intellectuals on the liberal side with their philosophy, with lack of morality, aka destruction of the family, destruction of God and country, where if you don't have a moral compass, if you don't have a moral foundation, you are going to have the intellectual community setting in motion atrocities. Universities a hundred years ago. Uh, it's 1924, and the greatest universities in the world are not Harvard and Stanford and Yale. The greatest universities are Heidelberg and Marburg, Tübingen, and Königsberg, the great German universities. They were really dominant in almost every field a hundred years ago. Uh, by comparison, the American universities were country clubs. Mm -hmm. The Nobel Prizes were won by German professors. If you were an ambitious scientist or classicist, and you had your first degree from Oxford, Cambridge, you had to get your PhD from Germany if you wanted to be taken seriously. So that, that's the context. Right, right. And so this is the reason in. why, this is the reason why um, the tech uh, universities like MIT just starts to come on right at about the Civil War, and primarily in chemistry. It was kind of, I believe it was chemistry that was their, their first uh, course. Um, they call them courses, like majors. So um, and it might have been also mechanical engineering uh, or civil engineering. But he's right, though, that the prominent tech, you know, polytechnic, Universities, those were all, those were all Germany. The Oppenheimer movie, where there's right. an interlude in which he, he feels compelled to go to yeah. Germany to study up on the latest yeah. in the field. Because physics was, uh, was really being done at the cutting edge there. Think uh, of all the great names of, of physics at that time, the majority in fact had uh, some kind of a background in, in German or East Central European universities. Okay, that's the context. Now, what is fascinating if you look at these institutions is that they were already right leaning even before World War One. Now, we, we, we tend to assume universities were always liberal, but that's not right. Mm -hmm. It's just that historically universities tend to have a lean, and the leaning in Germany prior to 1914 was conservative. Uh, and perhaps that shouldn't surprise us because it was the social elite that went to university. Uh, it was a much narrower section of society then than today. The trauma of defeat uh, in 1980 uh, led to a tremendous backlash, a backlash not only uh, against the Weimar Republic, the successor to the imperial regime, uh, but I think broadly a, a backlash against many other things associated with defeat, a backlash against uh, the Anglo-Saxon powers that had won the war. Uh, and it was in this context that many students and professors were highly attracted by an exciting new demagogic figure, Adolf Hitler, and his National Socialist G German Workers' Party. Now, the word workers is an interesting uh, term here because, in fact, it wasn't especially attractive to workers. Workers in the 1920s gravitated towards either the Social Democrats or the Communists. Uh, and so the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, in fact, in its early phase, as it grew in the 1920s and broke through electorally in 1932 and 33, was a party that was very attractive uh, to people with university degrees. And we can find that in the social life of, let's say, Marburg, uh, which is one of the typical universities which we got a very good study of, mm. uh, the way in which the radical right penetrated the student body and the professorship and anti-Semitism became institutionalized. So that, for example, in Marburg, the, the Student uh, Association for Jewish Students was effectively prescribed long before Hitler came to power. All right. Again, from your essay, a critical factor in 
So we're seeing that kind of in reverse, where these institutions of learning in the student body and the faculty are molding the people into a very um, anti-friendly agenda, if you and I'm saying this kindly, right? So you had the right wing in the 1920s being trained at the universities to be anti-Semitic. Now you have the left wing being trained to be anti-Semitic. Klein had followed the German universities. Jews begin leaving. Albert Einstein is the most famous, but many Jews leave. In the fall of the German universities was precisely that so many senior academics were Jews. For some, Hitler's anti-Semitism was therefore, and you set this off parenthetically, not unlike woke intersectionality in our own time. Hitler's anti-Semitism was therefore a career opportunity. Explain that. Well, if you think about why an ideology spreads, uh, there are two driving forces typically. Uh, the obvious one that people are just persuaded by it. They think, gosh, we really do need to have all the diversity and equity and inclusion, and I should really try and work towards that. Uh, but the other reason that ideologies spread is that there are people who gain uh, from them. Who, who is always the good question. Lenin wasn't wrong about that. And this uh, is the reason why everyone needs to start questioning when you start hearing people pushing Bitcoin or ESG or, you know, the idea of the 15, you know, minute city. You have to ask who's benefiting climate change, who's benefiting and AI. When you're talking about AI and Bitcoin, see, the truther movement thought that Bitcoin is a way to get away from the Federal Reserve. Eh, the Federal Reserve, you're not going to be able to get away from, no matter how hard you try, all right? Because there'll be a civil war before the fall of the Federal Reserve. So you have now this asset class that really doesn't really exist. It's very virtual. And it has no real store of value, right? Because a, a store of value in terms of a currency is a stable currency, not one that goes up too much and one that doesn't go down too much. Because both dynamics, if, if it's volatile, it can't be a storage of value. So Bitcoin is a technology. It's, serve, it, it, it's to roll out the backbone of the blockchain to be able to do surveillance to be able to track. So everyone that bought into this whole Bitcoin concept, you just beta tested metadata for a, a tracking system for currency when we are decached. Thank you very much. The average citizen is not going to benefit. You'll have billionaires and millionaires that benefit at different ways from this, but the big payout was the government being able to track you and go decash and to control you. That if you decide to support a certain candidate or say certain things because of certain things that are happening in your environment, they'll just shut you down. You, you're seeing this in real time with different activism that's taking place in Canada and the United States. They'll sanction an individual, not just a country. Thank you, everybody that bought into digital currencies. You beta tested and you ushered in an element of the Biopatriot Act. Thank you very much for doing that. And you're not going to benefit. The average person's not going to benefit from it. Now, when you're talking about this whole climate change, who's going to be benefiting from ESG? Who's going to be benefiting from going to these more renewable resources? Who's going to be benefiting from the lithium mining as they're trying to divest out of fossil fuels? Why is this? 
who's benefiting? Who's shorting the oil? Not just who's benefiting from green energy, but who's shorting oil? These are things that you need to start paying attention to. Who's benefiting from AI? The average person's going to be benefiting from AI by far. You got to start asking these questions. And how is AI going to be used to surveil you, to curtail your freedoms? This is another element of the Biopatriot Act. And oh, thank you for using chat GPT to train their models. Thank you for using these, you know, Bing AI chat um, search aspects to your to your web search, you're ushering in another element of the Biopatriot Act. Thank you very much. Sometimes don't use the technology as a better solution. Well, Johnny and, and Susie's using it, so I have to too. Well, if more people don't follow what Johnny and Susie are doing, you're, you are preventing the ushering in and the blossoming of that technology. And it's not going to make the society better off in the long run. You have to be more discerning. And in the case of uh, Germany in the 1930s, who who was that uh, the Gentile professors could screw over the Jewish ones? The Jewish professors were removed from their jobs because professors were civil servants, in effect, in the German system. Uh, they were kicked out of their jobs. Uh, it's one of the earliest things that the Nazis actually do when they come to power is to purge the civil service of Jews. Uh, that's a terrific career opportunity uh, if you're not Jewish and you can avoid the purge. Uh, and so you see the self-interest that motivated certain people to become Nazis. Uh, there's the expression, uh, the, the fallen of March, the uh, the people who became Nazis once it was clear that the Nazis... And this is what's happening with this whole feminist movement. All right? Follow me. Convince that females, you know, are deprived of opportunity. Create affirmative action. Get them into, you know, positions of authority. And I do think that women need opportunity to go into, you know, uh, you know, other professions and stuff. I'm not against them going in, but the thing is, is that you put there are people that were taking advantage of, of of women, and they were pushing a feminist agenda, where you get women into into a certain position, and then they start trickling in more DEI, and then the reparations. that you try to convince people, well, if you follow this kind of agenda, that the male, white male is bad, then you'll benefit. You'll be able to get their job. You'll get, be able to make more money. Only to eventually hit even the white female with a reparation tax or a reparation increase in inflation. That's what DEI is. What he just said, convince people that you will benefit if you change a certain policy and kick out the ones that were oppressing you. How's that any different than what was going on in Nazi Germany? The Jewish professors must have been oppressing the, the, the professors that were not Jewish. Therefore, let's kick out the Jewish professors and add more to the roster of non-Jewish professors. Kick out those oppressors. How is that any different than this rhetoric that we're hearing about structural racism? Because with structural racism, what they basically mean is the oppressor has to be kicked out. Well, what does that mean? It means white female and white male is getting kicked out. Now, this sounds very racist, right? But the thing is, is there was an analog that happened back in the 1920s, the 1930s, that we're not paying attention to. And this is the reason why that Martin Luther King's speech is right. 
It should be based on the character of the individual, not the color of their skin. And so even the black community isn't listening to what MLK was saying. Because they took it, they want something. They want a handout. They want something to take away from an oppressor because you have an elite class in, in the universities convincing students and convincing the society at large that the oppressor needs to be taken down. That they're they're that the that the the black community and all these other minorities are oppressed. The thing is, it's the power of the wallet. If you stop buying products that are pushing this agenda, then these companies will go bankrupt. If you stop supporting the universities that are pushing these agendas, they will change their tune. Because it's all about money. We really were in power about uh, the massive increase in Nazi party membership after Hitler is very clearly uh, establishing a dictatorship. I find this a very interesting moment in German history because it's the moment when the opportunists join the convinced. It was risky to be a Nazi before. 1933, uh, you were part of an oppositional movement and you were quite likely to be involved in violence because street fighting was part of the name of the game in late Weimar Germany. But after Hitler's clearly established a dictatorship and the Nazism won, the opportunists flock. Now, you might think that this is an analogy, to, an analogy too far, but I don't think it is. Because what's fascinating about academic life in America in the last 10 years is the, the ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion, let's call it wokeism for short, has been a great career opportunity for some people. And it's also been a terrific opportunity to kick anybody suspected of conservatism out of academia. So the systematic discrimination that has been going on, and it's quite overt in most universities now against people who are ideologically to the right, has of course been a career opportunity uh, for others, that's a good way to think about how institutions get captured. It's the combination of believers and opportunists. And opportunists. Once again, from your essay. And, and here I want to make sure that I understand whether you're making a strong or weak version of the argument. I tend to make strong. You do arguments. tend to, Neil. You know, I do know that. I'm quoting you. The lesson of German history for American academia should now be clear. In Germany, to use the legalistic language of 2023, speech crossed into conduct. The final solution of the Jewish question began as speech. To be precise, it began as lectures and monographs and scholarly articles, close quote. All right. German universities failed to stop it, though that much is clear. But are you making a much stronger argument that the universities helped to produce the Holocaust. So in the words of the late Milton Himmelfarb, no Hitler, no, ho no Holocaust. Are you arguing no universities, no Holocaust? Well, Hitler was not uh, a tremendously sophisticated thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, what's in Mein Kampf is a ragbag of ideas about race, uh, about living space, uh, borrowed from various quarters, including the United States. A lot of Hitler's ideas about race actually come from the United States. Same goes for the Nazis' embrace of eugenics. Uh, there's not a very clear path in Mein Kampf to uh, a solution of, quote-unquote, the Jewish question. Uh, in order to achieve the murder of roughly six million Jews, uh, you need some people to uh, articulate the mechanisms. And what is very striking to me about German academia uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, before the outbreak uh, of World War II, before the Holocaust in fact begins, is the amount of research that's produced to, for example, explain why you would want uh, to annihilate the mentally ill, uh, to explain why you would want to drive Jews and Slavs out of Eastern Europe to create a new German living space. Uh, and this production of the detail uh, of what we have come to call the Holocaust 
uh, is not the work of Goebbels' propaganda ministry. Much of it is the work of people working in departments in German universities. There are even doctoral theses on uh, how to make use of the, uh, the, the, the fillings, the gold fillings. Uh, in, uh, in, in Jewish skulls. So I think it's a very important feature of Nazism that is not well enough understood perhaps because we don't teach the history of the Third Reich at universities the way we used to, that what makes the Third Reich distinctive, makes it different from the Soviet Union, is the extreme sophistication with which a program of mass systematic murder is carried out. Uh, it is a very much more sophisticated operation than any other genocide or democide, if you want to use that term, in history. And that's because it had at its disposal the most sophisticated technocratic elite that the world then had. And that was the, the German technocratic elite. Right. Now, by now, I feel certain some of our listeners will be agreeing with your friends. They'll be saying... This is all fascinating as a matter of history, but there Neil Ferguson goes again, exaggerating away. What happened there could not happen here because the cases are virtually opposite. The German universities glorify the German state and the dominant ethnic group, the so-called Aryan race. American universities don't glorify America. They're very happy to have the borders erased. They're one-worlders, they're internationalists. They're not committed to glorifying the dominant wasp, the old wasp ascendancy. On the contrary, they're committed to humiliating it on behalf of other ethnic groups. So the cases are not just different, but almost opposite to each other. Why is that wrong? Well, if it becomes uh, the conventional wisdom on campus, uh, that uh, from uh, the rivers of the sea, Palestine shall be free and Israel should be locked from the map, and that Hamas is a legitimate, there's engagement with legitimate uh, uh, insurrection against the settler colonists, then at the very least, you have a significant proportion of educated America endorsing a second Holocaust, because that's what Hamas had in mind. That's what we saw a trailer for on October the 7th. Uh, we should have no doubts in our minds about the intentions of Iran and its proxies in the Middle East. They wish to wipe Israel from the map. And they're explicit about that. And they're setting about achieving that objective. Anybody, Jew or non-Jew, in the Western world who is willing to accept that outcome is willing to accept the Second Holocaust. And I think uh, your sceptical listeners should pause for a moment and ask themselves if they wish to live to see that happen after the horrific uh, events of the early 1940s and the repeated avowals of Western leaders that that should never happen again. We, we glimpsed on October the 7th, we glimpsed in the sadistic violence that was perpetrated against Israeli civilians the spirit of a second Holocaust. Yeah. And I shudder when I see opinion polling on both sides of the Atlantic showing clearly uh, that young Americans and young Britons disproportionately, overwhelmingly side with the Palestinians against Israel, and they're even willing to contemplate uh, that outcome, the wiping of Israel from the map. So don't be under any illusions about what that means in practice. Uh, because it's precisely illusions about what it means in practice that persisted through the 1930s into the 1940s and led many people to disbelieve that the Holocaust was being committed even as the death camps went about their hideous work. In recent weeks, I'm taking some of you. I have to do a commercial for PNN. Please go to my store at the-studio-reykjavik.com. And if you would like to help support my news coverage, you find the stuff that I say interesting, you're learning something from it. If you would like to help support, please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. And on the home page at the very bottom, you can donate through Stripe, PayPal, or buy me a coffee. You can also click the link below this video to get to that website, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Or there's also a link under this video for buying me a coffee. 
So please help support by donating. Better yet, you can also go to my store and get the health products uh, if you are in the United States to, to help boost up your health and follow my protocol. I have structural nano silver gel and this can be used to help neutralize pathogens. You put it on your hands, it stays active for five hours. You can put it around your mouth, around your nose, lightly coast your nostrils. You can put it around your ears and your eyes. You can also use this as a skincare. You put it on a cut, an abrasion, and it'll heal quicker. But you can also put it on your skin, not just your face, but you know, anywhere on the body. And, and do that on a regular basis, go to the go to bed, right? You put it on your skin right before you go to bed. And then when you wake up, you exfoliate, and you do that each morning and you'll notice that the skin is getting healthier. Now, this is one of the products in my skincare box, anti-aging skincare box that I will promote later in a different video, but you can go to the store and get the skincare box to get all the different components, but uh, the topical part of this skincare is the structural nano silver gel. So if you're, if you would like to neutralize pathogens, uh, and it's much better than Perel, uh, please put this on your hands and it'll stay active for five hours. Get a couple tubes of this for your family. Go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. It's very important to improve your gut biome by taking the probiotic that I have on my store. I have two types. I have a, a powdered version and a tablet version. The powder version is the one that's in my hand. You just mix it with your food. I put it in hummus mid-afternoon. Uh, take it every day and you'll get that proper gut biome. You, I also have tablet form that you can get. So. Some people prefer the tablet, not the powder. Some people prefer the powder, not the tablet. So I offer both varieties. So go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the probiotic that will help with improving the absorption of your gut to, to improve the consistency of the stools and the communication between your gut and your liver and, and the communication between your gut and your brain. It will improve your metabolism. I have partnered up with Rainbow Herbals and we've created these different deodorant bars made from essential oils from the Himalayas. They're all natural. It's for males and females. You can get it in citrus and you can also get it in peppermint, lavender, and tea tree. So please go to the store, get a couple of the deodorants for your household. It's for males and females. And I believe in providing things that have dual purpose. Like for example, the structural nano silver gel. It helps neutralize pathogens, but it also helps to improve your skin. Well, the deodorant bar not only can be used as a deodorant when you're using it every day, but it helps to detoxify your body because the, the, the essential oils that are coming from the Himalayas are very, very high quality. So please go to my store and get the deodorant bars. Back to the news because this is PNN. You mentioned people who were sh shocked by what had happened at their alma maters. Bill Ackman has become famous. I have to say, three weeks ago, I didn't know who he was. Today, I'm tempted to write him in for president. Um, he's been investigating the prevailing ethic at his alma mater, Harvard, where he was not only an undergraduate, but to which he's given some $50 million. Here's from one of his posts on Twitter, now known as X. And Ackman's a wonderfully articulate almost sweetly naive, he's writing about it as he's working it out. I'm quoting him, the E for equity in DEI, DEI, as you said, stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. E for equity is about equality of outcome, equity rights, not equality of opportunity. Under DEI, one's degree of oppression is determined based on where one resides in the so-called intersectional pyramid of oppression, where whites, Jews, and Asians are deemed oppressors. DEI is racist, because reverse racism is racism, even if it is against white people. And it is remarkable that I even need to point this out, close quote. That strikes me as I think it strikes you 
See, the problem with, with Miss, Miss Austin and, you know, the establishment that's pushing reparations, they keep on pushing this idea of structural racism. So if you go, well, you're reverse discriminating other races, so that's racism. They'll go, but you're an oppressor and you're causing the structural racism for us. It's creating these haves and have nots and they want to do the blame game. The problem is, is that you have an estate. This is the big takeaway. Who's going to benefit from this? All right. Democratic Party is trying to buy the black vote by waving reparations in front of their face. Now, if you don't like that, if that sounds racist or whatever, I don't fucking care. The reality of the situation is this. The Democratic Party is trying to buy the black vote through reparations. We didn't have to wait until just a couple of weeks ago if you've been reading you all these years. But a pretty accurate summation of what DEI is. Here's my next question. We can understand, this is not to excuse it, but we can understand where anti-Semitism came from in Germany. Germany had been defeated in the First World War. You have an entire nation that's looking for a scapegoat. What happened? It was the Jews that did it. It didn't quite make sense, but you can see how it filled a psychological craving. The United States represents the most powerful nation in the world. Academics now holding tenure came to their positions during a quarter of a century of unparalleled prosperity and relative peace. How do you explain the emergence of DEI in American universities? Well, um, Bill Ackman was well known to me uh, long before uh, uh, you came across him uh, as one of the world's most successful activist hedge fund managers. And he just turned his activism uh, away from corporations that were being badly run to the Harvard Corporation and, uh, and Harvard University. And I just wish he'd done it sooner. I also uh, share your admiration for his recent writings, uh, which are uh, models of lucidity. Uh, but I think I could put it more uh, brutally, uh, because diversity, equity, and inclusion is a kind of newspeak in Orwell's sense. It actually means the exact opposite of what it says. The diversity they aspire to is uniformity, uniformity of ideological outlook. Equity is actually uh, entirely absent because there's no due process when the DEI bureaucracy goes into action. Uh, and as for inclusion, the real objective is exclusion of those who are not conforming to the ideology of the progressive left. So that's the reality. This is a Where very we important. We are living in 1984 now. All right. Now, many Gen Xers had to read the book. You know, usually it was in high school. I don't know if it's a required reading now. But 1984, we're living in right now. Now, one of the key aspects to this is conformity, conform, conform, right? And that the, the government is, you know, uh, uh, telling you to live a certain way and the way things are in, rea in the world, in their lens is, is much different than reality, okay? And they use different terms. Peace is war, right? Um, you know, so, you know, kind of think almost the opposite. You know, when you're starting to hear, you know, green energy, all right, or clean energy, but a part of that portfolio, right, is nuclear power. How can that be green, especially when, the, when you're mining uranium? Or what do you do with the nuclear waste? I'd much rather put hydrocarbons for another two or three centuries into the atmosphere than to have another Fukushima or Chernobyl. Or even if you don't have a Fukushima or a Chernobyl, what do you do with all the plants that are going to be decommissioned soon? Because there are a lot of nuclear plants that need to be decommissioned. Uh, around the world, but especially in the United States, 
What do you do with all the nuclear waste? It just sits there. And then we're going to get more land and create more nuclear plants. Is that really green? This is the problem. When you're listening to the news and they're pushing agendas, it's think the opposite. Because that was one of the key takeaways in 1984. From. That's quite easy, I think, to explain. Well, the universities in the 1960s already lent liberal. Uh, you mentioned uh, the late Henry Kissinger. He was already unusual in the 1960s to be a conservative Republican professor. Uh, the problem in the 1970s and 80s was that the liberals had a tendency to hire Marxists uh, over other liberals. And then in due course, the Marxists uh, would hire cultural Marxists, the post-1989 version of Marxism, which switched uh, economics out in favor of identity politics. When you lost the class war, as the left did spectacularly in the 1980s, and you lost the Cold War too, what was left? Well, it turned out that the answer was identity politics. And identity politics is designed to be hostile to individual liberty by insisting that nobody is an individual. Everybody belongs to some category or other uh, of identity, ethnic, uh, sexual, gender, uh, racial, religious, you name it. And once you've identified uh, the uh, identity category to which an individual belongs, they can then be ranked uh, according to the uh, level of victimhood. Uh, and if you are white male, I'm afraid we're both nearly dead white males, we're right at the bottom of the rankings. And if we were women of colour who consistently voted Democrat, and perhaps if we were uh, also uh, uh, of a certain sexual orientation, we'd be near the top. And that's roughly how it works. It's a very insidious uh, ideology because it's so uh, divisive. And at the same time, it, it simply abstracts the individual's identity and replaces it with some group identity. Uh, what I think many Jewish liberals hadn't noticed uh, was their descent down the rankings uh, from oppressed, and it would be hard pressed to say that anybody in the 1940s was more oppressed uh, than the Jews, but uh, strangely, the Jews uh, were demoted to the very bottom of the table and they became part uh, of the oppressor uh, uh, groups. Uh, now, why did that happen? Two things, and this is really important. One, this had always been a part of the leftist propaganda of the late Cold War. Anti-Zionism was part of what the Soviets did when they found that they were really badly losing in the Middle East and were gradually being uh, squeezed out. Uh, hostility uh, to Israel, support for Arab nationalists was part and parcel of Soviet strategy. Hence, anti-Zionism was a part of the left's propaganda uh, when I was a student in the 1980s. But what you added on top of that more recently uh, was something with a quite different intellectual origin, the Islamism, uh, the political Islam, that has become better and better represented uh, in universities. And in a fascinating way, the different elements of the wokest movement coalesced despite their obvious differences. Why on earth would you have queers for Palestine? Uh, to give just one example of the strange phenomena we've seen since October the 7th, how long would a group of young gay men last in Gaza if they proclaimed their sexual orientation? Not long, not because long. that's not really Hamas's bag. But in the weird parallel world of the American campus, queers for Palestine makes perfect sense. Uh, and so we have a great realignment on campus. Uh, and it was only really after October the 7th that Michael Ackman realized that in that great realignment, uh, their people, uh, their group, uh, of Jews, had been major losers. The case of Claudine Gay, you were at Harvard for not quite a decade, as I recall. Oh, okay, 12 years. Oh, you were there for a dozen years. All right, so you know this institution well. It's also the oldest institution in this country, and by any measure, the most prestigious, also the richest, an endowment of going on $50 billion. 
Here's Claudine Kaye, then president of Harvard, under questioning from Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, herself a graduate of Harvard, on December 5th, 2023. Well, let me ask you this. Will admissions offers be rescinded or any disciplinary action be taken against students or applicants who say, from the river to the sea or intifada advocating for the murder of Jews? As I've said, that type of hateful, reckless, offensive speech is personally abhorrent to me. And today that when no action will be taken? What action will be taken? When speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies, including policies against bullying, harassment, or intimidation, we take action and we have robust disciplinary processes that allow us to hold individuals accountable. All right, there's then President Gay drawing a distinction between speech, mere words on one hand, and action on the other. What was wrong with that answer? Well, the only thing wrong with it was that that had not been her position prior to those hearings. And we know this because uh, in her time as uh, mm -hmm. Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Claudine Gay was quite active in going after those who spoke in ways that were considered uh, by her and other uh, progressive uh, academic administrators to be unacceptable. Uh, what's funny about the and that theory. was what happened. I did a show. I, I did a video about this, but that's what happened to Rowan. And you know, he was proving that this whole DEI thing was not going to work for children, especially in the in the black community, and that you need to focus on them in the early stages because there's a compounding effect and give them the opportunities to flourish instead of you know, these policies of just throwing more money into a system, uh, especially later down, you know, down, the, down the path, and it's not gonna do much. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change much. It's get you know, early, it's about, uh, I tell you, it, it seems so, such a simple idea but it's so powerful. It's about God, country, and family. God gives you the morality. So you do the right thing for everybody, right? And you don't judge someone based on just the color of their skin, but you judge them based on the, their, their character, right? And there's a, there's a moral compass that people have. So there's not stealing and all this stuff, right? Country. So you have this, this, this idea of trying to make your society better, right? And to be a law-abiding individual and to know the history of the country, the good and the bad, and to make it a, a more perfect union, as Lincoln would say, and family. By having a strong family unit, it's going to be the brick for society. It's such a simple idea, but having that is going to make the society better. And Rollin was saying that you need to invest in children. You have to have a more stable household, right? And by doing this, you're going to have this compound effect. If you if you invest in these children at a young age, these black children at a young age, and they have the proper home stability, they can flourish in these settings. So it's, you know, when you have a family that hates the country and, you know, has a, a, a different national anthem, we only have one national anthem in the United States, not two, all right? But you have these families that have this concept they have this taking the knee down kind of crap, all right? They are lawless and they don't have an affinity to God. And they're destroying the family unit because of, you know, all the homes are broken. This is a major problem. This is a major problem for, for, the, the, for the poor families out there. The single mothers, you know, these children are suffering from this, these kinds of situations.
that we just saw a clip from was the speed with which she and the other university presidents who were testifying mugged up on the First Amendment, uh, which uh, they clearly been briefed about uh, before the hearings. That was the whole point about the uh, when speech crosses into conduct piece, because actually the United States offers really quite terrific protections, at least from the state's uh, interference in speech. You are allowed to say really obnoxious things in this country. Uh, that, that's the nature of freedom. But if you were to start uh, acting on the basis of your hateful statements, uh, engaging in violence against minorities or explicitly threatening to do uh, violent acts, then you would have actually uh, come out from under the protection of the First Amendment. And there's a very clear body of law uh, in the United States that goes back many decades that clarifies what free speech means here. The trouble is that was not how things were on the Harvard campus in recent years. On the contrary, numerous professors, including uh, at least two African-American professors that I can think of, had got on the wrong side of the university administration. Things they said, not for conduct, but for things that were said. And that, that's really what made her testimony infuriating. Uh, it was this belated discovery that there really ought to be First Amendment rights on the Harvard campus. There hadn't been for years. Claudine Gay resigned as president of Harvard on January 2nd. According to press accounts, it's only First Amendment if it's against the oppressor. If you're saying things like that is antithetical to the oppressor, then it's protected speech. But if the oppressor is saying something against the oppressed, then we got to fight them. That's what happened with Claudia Gay. Harvard Corporation, the body that holds ultimate authority at Harvard, the Harvard Corporation stood behind Gay after her testimony before Congress that we just heard, withdrawing its support for her only after charges of plagiarism emerged. So plagiarism, there are two questions here. The first obvious question, we all looked at the, here's what she said, here's where she got it, those pictures of, have been all over the internet. The first question is, it, was it genuine plagiarism or as they tried to maintain for a number of days, just sloppy paraphrasing, forgetting to put in quotation marks, she mere inadvertence. Do you have a view on that? I do. And with serial plagiarism and uh, the things that uh, Claudine Gay did were things that Harvard students were severely disciplined for uh, during the time that I was at Harvard. And any uh, professional academic knew it at a glance, isn't that right? Yes. Oh, this right. was not controversial. It was, of course, bizarre that anybody should have tried to rationalize what was clearly very extreme and obvious and repeated plagiarism. Plagiarism even of the acknowledgement section, which I've never seen before, quite remarkable. All right. And the, of course, the second question is whether the Harvard Corporation was right, that her testimony was, was something they could have written out, but it was the plagiarism that finally made her position untenable. Just on the politics of it, first of all, are those the kinds of calculations that the Harvard Corporation or any body of trustees at one of these great institutions ought to be making? And were they, um, were they reasonable? Were they correct in that sort of calculation? The Harvard Corporation should never have appointed, appointed Claudine Gay president in the first place. I mean, and everything predictably followed from that decision. If all that happens at Harvard is that there's a new president chosen by the same corporation, nothing fundamentally will change. And one must understand, you know, and I don't want to make this all about Harvard, this is a problem for all universities. It's a problem also for Stanford. It's a problem for Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. It's a problem for much less well-known institutions because one must realize that these problems are pervasive. Look at the heterodox academy surveys of student sentiment across the country around 60% of students across the country say that they feel uncomfortable speaking their minds in class uh, because of the consequences that might follow. Uh, this is even true at Chicago, which prides itself on, on its uh, free speech culture. So I think we mustn't make this all about Harvard. There's a problem throughout American academia. It's a problem of ideological capture, of politicization, of the perversion of the institution, its deviation from the pursuit of truth.
and the pursuit of, of, of thinking that is truly free. Uh, in order to fix this, we need more than a new Harvard president. We need a fundamental change in, in the nature of university governance uh, from top to bottom. Okay, so two quotations, both posts from Twitter. Quotation number one from a post by Constantine Kissin, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Quote, one of the biggest benefits of Bill Ackman's successful campaign to dismantle discriminatory practices at elite colleges is that it proves something that many of us have been saying for a long time. All it takes is for a few people with power, money, and influence to start standing up to this crap, and it'll be over. Quotation two, Jordan Peterson. Bill Ackman, for all his good work, appears to have no real idea how far down the rabbit hole the universities have gone. Plagiarism might not be the least of their problems, but it's a long way down the list. Neil, who's right? Well, in a way, they're both right. A lot has been achieved in a relatively short time. Uh, when uh, Since October 7th. Since October 7th. Uh, and not only uh, because of Bill Ackman, there have been many other people who have uh, either publicly or privately expressed their uh, horror at the way that things have been going at the major universities. That, that's good. And it can only, uh, I think, uh, begin the process uh, of change. And that's where Jordan Peterson is right. There's a lot more here that's wrong than just plagiarism. I think there's a lot of plagiarism. I suspect that we'll spend 2024 reading on a more or less weekly basis about the plagiarists, because part of the problem is that when you set aside academic standards to pursue diversity, equity, inclusion, in other words, you start making appointments not on the basis of ability and performance and achievement, but on the basis of what is here plagiarism. That is not a random that's not just a correlation. Well, you're essentially, of course, because yeah. you're essentially going to start giving promotion and preferment to inferior scholars. And how do inferior scholars get by? Uh, plagiarism, plagiarism is one of the ways that uh, that people get by who are not really up to it. That's, mm -hmm. So that's part of it. The Jordan Peterson is right that the problems are, are profound. Uh, and as I said, it's it's not just that the wrong people have been appointed to senior positions. It's it's not just that there's a lot of plagiarism, and there certainly is. By the way, it's not just that there's a crisis of replication in the natural and social sciences, because let's not forget, there are problems there too, otherwise Stanford presumably would still have a, a, a president. There are all kinds of problems in the academy that need to be addressed, but they won't be addressed simply by replacing presidents or even boards of trustees. They have to be addressed by changing the way that universities are run. And one of the recommendations that I have made in the last month uh, on behalf of the new university uh, that we are founding in Austin, Texas, is that there should be proper constitutional protection within a university's governance system of free speech, of academic freedom, and it needs to be enforced. It's all very well having the Chicago principles and they sign grant. But if they're not enforced, uh, if undergraduates don't feel free to speak because there may be consequences, then what use are they? So the University of Austin will be quite unique in that it will model a new kind of academic governance in which the freedom of students and professors alike will be protected and that freedom will be enforced. All right. So you've just mentioned, well, let me do uh, another product placement here. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nail silver soaps. This one is oatmeal. This one is peppermint. And the two other ones that I have in my hand are charcoal tea tree and lavender. This is a structural nail silver soap that will neutralize pathogens. It's a high quality soap. So please go to my store and get a couple bars of this for your household. In addition, I also have C60. C60, for the ones that don't know, is a very strong antioxidant, all right? You can get it in coconut or in avocado oil. I have it in a two ounce, a four ounce, and an eight ounce configuration. You take a full dropper of this or a teaspoon of it a day. And it's a very strong antioxidant and it'll neutralize free radicals. By doing that, you're reducing the stress on the cell and improving the cellular health. But you're also improving the mitochondrial health. And by improving the mitochondrial health, 
you're going to boost up your ATP and, and improve your energy. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the C60 either in coconut oil, which is what I have in my hand, or the avocado oil in two ounce, four ounce, or eight ounce configuration. It's a great antioxidant. You take it every day and you're going to start to notice a slowing down of the aging process. I want to give you a moment to expand on that. But if the question is, what is to be done over the longer term, here's what occurs to this layman's mind. On the one hand, we have a tax code, which has favored universities for decades, of permitting a Harvard to accumulate an endowment of 50 billion, which is by far the large, not actually not by that. Harvard, Yale, and Stanford are all in multiple tens of billions of dollars. Princeton is not far behind. These are rich institutions. You can change the tax code. You can point out that during the Cold War is when the moment is when federal funding of research at these institutions began to become routine. But this is in the 1950s when the institutions were making common cause with the rest of the nation. And now the institutions are entirely in a world of their own, that their own intellectual world, this woke DEI world. So cut off the funding, Republicans in Congress. And then the third alternative is just say, all right, Harvard may date to the early 17th century, but the hell of a place. We're going to found an entirely new set of institutions, such as the University of Boston, which I believe is what, formally speaking, it's about two years old now, and the first students will be admitted next autumn, I believe. Okay, so how do you rank those? The, those possible approach. How, what is, what's the rest of the country do to say, stop this nonsense? We're going to make you stop it. Well, I think the, the, the philanthropic culture of the United States is one, is one of its glories. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the universities are not public institutions, as they were in Germany, mm -hmm. but are in uh, substantial measure private institutions is a good thing. We should be wary of breaking that unique model, which really doesn't have a counterpart elsewhere. Uh, so I'm, I'm wary of the, uh, the argument that this is a problem for Congress that must be solved by new taxes. Uh, I, I would say that the solution to the problem of the excessive wealth of Harvard uh, is for donors to stop giving it money that it clearly doesn't need and wastes. Uh, the donor class should stop donating to these institutions that are po promoting DEI. But in addition, these schools should have their endowment taxed. They, 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 they are getting too big and too influential, and therefore there should be taxation on their endowment. And their tune would totally change, totally change. And then on top, so, so it's taxation on the endowment, it's the donor class not donating to DEI, and it's creating new institutions that are more free thinking. All three. Who would rather they gave the money uh, to a new institution that would make much better use of it? And that's why I prefer an authentically American solution to this problem, which is these universities don't work very well. Let's create some new ones. That was the spirit that produced the University of Chicago and the university that we're sitting in today at Stanford. Uh, and so the American solution shouldn't be government needs to fix this. The American solution should be let's stop giving money to these institutions. They're not fit for purpose. Let's give the money to, to new institutions, and those new institutions uh, will ideally flourish without federal funds, particularly if the federal funds come with uh, Title IX and other obligations. Because remember, part of the problem here, Peter, is that the government got too involved mm. in the universities. It got too involved in their finances, and then it started getting involved in their governance. And Title IX is a good example of the problem. There are almost as many Title IX officers, I would guess, at this university as DEI officers, and they're all part of the problem. These universities are rich. Because they're rich, they were allowed to have, they are allowed to grow these enormous bureaucracies of non-academics, people not engaged in research or in teaching, purely engaged in administration. They're a huge part of the problem. Uh, and I think the only solution, because it's very hard to get rid of these bureaucracies once they exist, is start over. And if we succeed in Austin, if we can create a new model of university that doesn't work, like the old ones, but actually believes what it says about pursuing truth. 
then ideally we'll force these uh, older institutions to change their ways. The simplest way to win this fight is to create a better institution that attracts the smartest people, as students and the smartest people as professors. Once you start attracting those people, the money follows. And pretty quickly, people have to shape up and they have to change their ways. This has happened before. Oxford and Cambridge didn't worry about doctorates until the German universities started to. And in many ways, the American universities were modeled off the German universities in their heyday. Nothing stays the same. It, oddly enough, academia, for all that it appears unworldly, is a very competitive place. And there really is still, in the end, a market for genius and a market for new ideas. And the trouble is, uh, that market's moving. It's leaving Harvard. Uh, and oddly enough, it's heading for Austin, Texas. See you there. Oh, Last question. Yeah. One final time. For this is a good segue. It is important to be a discerning citizen, an informed citizen, especially when it comes to science. There's There are a lot of science blogs out there. There are a lot of science channels. There's a lot of information in the mainstream media about things that are happening in science, especially in medicine. And I think that to bridge the gap of knowledge, it's important to learn more about medicine and science. So I've created these lectures about certain systems about dealing with the human body. The first module that I created was a series of lectures on the pulmonary system, so pulmonology. And and, um, you know, for $50, you can watch 22 lectures and download 22 lecture PDFs that will teach you many aspects to pulmonology. That's radiolo radiology, that's embryology, anatomy of the, the pulmonary system, different diseases like tuberculosis and cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, functional testing, how um, COPD happens, what's the pathophysiology of COPD and, and asthma. Um, you know, so I go over a lot of stuff, all right? So each day I release a new video on the, the pulmonology module and you uh, a you can watch that lecture and download that pdf i have four more lectures to upload and then that module will be complete so there's uh there's 18 so far lectures up so please go to the store Click on classes and purchase the, the pulmonology module for fifteen for uh, for $50. And uh, that $50 will allow you to download the PDFs and watch the lectures. You will have access. You can watch the lectures as many times as you want. When you make the purchase, you're going to get in an email your unique password. And you'll be able to log in. And that will allow you to see the videos and to download the PDFs. It's a great way to learn. The whole idea is for you to get some better understanding of how the human body works. And each module that I release going forward is going to teach you a different system of the body. It's a lot of information for only $50. And the key here is so you can be a more discerning citizen while you watch the media, while you watch videos, while you, you know, read articles, you read maybe a published paper. And it, it changes the, that power dynamic between the patient and the physician. You're gonna be more informed about your own health and you'll be able to ask very poignant questions to your physician so you're not taken advantage of. So please go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and purchase the pulmonology module for fifty dollars. The December essay, "The Treason of the Intellectuals," quote: "Only if the once great American universities can reestablish throughout their fabric the separation of Wissenschaft from Politik." Wissenschaft, you've already said, is the 
science or academia scholarship. That's scholarship. 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 scholarship from politique, politics. Only then can they be sure of avoiding the fate of the German universities, close quote. You published that essay just six weeks ago. Are you more optimistic today than, they, than you were the day you published it? Well, I'm habitually not optimistic, as you know, uh, Peter, having, You're grown, a doer, having grown up in Scotland. Uh, but I'm a little bit more optimistic because I think it's been brought home forcibly uh, to trustees uh, uh, all across the country, not just at, at Harvard, uh, that they have to change uh, the way they go about things, that they can no longer allow the ideologues, uh, the progressives, uh, to call the shots. And that, that has to be a step in the right direction. Well, you and I are fellows at the Hoover Institution. The Hoover Institution is a rather unique institution uh, in that it's a semi-autonomous republic uh, and within uh, Stanford University. Why is there no Hoover Institution at Harvard? Ever wonder? Uh, or at Yale? Well, they could use a Hoover Institution in those places. Uh, one of the reasons that I believe passionately in what we do here at Hoover is that we are the counterculture to DEI. Uh, and if we can continue to show that it's possible to engage in scholarship in a way that is not politicized, uh, if we can be an institution that shows that liberals and conservatives can work together on academic problems, leaving politics at the threshold, then we'll also be acting as role models. So I'm kind of hopeful, just a little bit hopeful, Peter, that the probability of there being Hoover institutions at other universities just went up from 0% to, I don't know, maybe 5 maybe 5%. And the University of Austin, we have people who will be listening to this who will be hearing about the University of Austin for the first time. UATX.org is the website. UAustin.org. UATX is the abbreviation. We only became accredited because you know, I have to go through bureaucratic hoops even in Texas. Uh, just last year, uh, our first students will be admitted. Uh, we'll start studying in the fall of 2024. And I think it's the classic American solution to a problem. Don't leave it to the government. Do it yourself. Build something new. Neil Ferguson. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institute. Thank you for listening. That will conclude this transmission. Uh, but please make sure you subscribe to all my channels. I have YouTube, Brighton, BitChute, and Rumble. It's really important that you subscribe and you follow me on X and Getter so you get notified. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and help support my work through your donations or purchasing the products that I offer. That's eBooks, that's supplements, and that's courses. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.